Prince Harry makes history as the first senior royal in over a century to give testimony in court. Arriving under the glare of the press cameras, the King's son cross-examined for hours by a King's counsel. Prince Harry said in his civil case against Mirror Group newspapers that blood stained their typing fingers. We'll examine what this all means, not just for Harry, but the royal family and the British press. Also News at 10 tonight. A torrent of water threatens thousands and floods Ukraine's front lines. Kyiv accuses Moscow of causing the disaster. The PGA throws its lot in with Saudi-backed Live Golf. Sports washing or the best and most realistic outcome for golf. A special report on America's addiction to guns, a nation where there are more bullets than people. One beat officer told me she sees guns almost every single day, and some of her colleagues who've served in Afghanistan think these streets are more dangerous. And you may fail first, but technology may have the answer to climbing the near impossible. This is ITV News at 10 with Raggy Omar. Good evening. Prince Harry spent today as he has much of his life at the centre of the world's attention. But even for him, this was new territory. His High Court appearance made him the first senior royal to enter a witness box for over 130 years. It was a defining moment in what he's called his life's work to reform the British press and how it reports on public figures and their private lives. It was a showdown 38 years in the making. During nearly five hours on the stand and through a written statement, he unleashed a series of broadsides against the Daily Mirror's publisher, which he accuses of phone hacking. Harry spoke of how constant intrusion left him deeply paranoid and cost him precious personal relationships. This is about more than what he believes, though. All day, the Mirror's lawyer sparred with him, highlighting legal means through which the 33 stories in question could have been obtained. So often debated in the court of public opinion, this time a judge will decide the validity of the prince's claims. He says the frenzied interest of journalists was once so suffocating it forced him from his royal role. But Prince Harry wants the cameras to record this moment. Prince Harry, who do you want to hold accountable and why? The King's son appearing at the King's Bench Division of the High Court to, in his words, expose the utterly vile criminal activity of the tabloid press the first senior royal in living memory to be cross-examined in court as he takes on Mirror Group newspapers. Standing in the witness box, a moment in history, but also one of deep personal significance for a man who says tabloid harassment since his childhood has caused him paranoia and depression. He accuses the publisher of the Daily Mirror, the Sunday Mirror and the People of phone hacking and illegally obtaining his private information. He told the court he finds it shocking that articles like these revealed his private medical information when he was a child, saying he was often teased at school as a result. He says stories like this one about his relationship with Chelsea Davy made him feel like he was under constant surveillance, hunted by the media. And he points to this article about Caroline Flack, whom he briefly dated, saying the impact these kind of stories had on my relationships cannot be underestimated. Even those I trusted the most, I ended up doubting. It's only now, he says in his witness statement, realising what the defendant's journalists were doing and how they were getting their information, that I can see how much of my life was wasted on this paranoia. I've always heard people refer to my mother as paranoid, but she wasn't. She was fearful of what was actually happening to her, and now I know that I was the same. He told the court he felt physically sick over payments that Mirror Group journalists made to private investigators relating to his mother, Princess Diana. 
He singles out former Daily Mirror editor Piers Morgan for criticism, saying the thought of him earwigging to his mother's private messages makes him even more determined to hold those responsible accountable for their vile and entirely unjustified behaviour. You continue to trash her. OK, I'm done with this. No, no, no. Piers Morgan's past comments about the Duchess of Sussex cost him his job at ITV. Today, Prince Harry accused him of subjecting the couple to a barrage of horrific personal attacks and intimidation. Well, good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Far away from but on his show tonight, this was his only reference to the globally covered court case. And whining members of the royal family. He seemed nervous at times in the witness box as he was cross-examined. One awkward moment came when he was asked about revelations of his drug-taking when he was a teenager. When it was put to him that it was in the public interest, he replied, there's a difference between the public interest and what interests the public. But if he seemed hesitant at all in court, the words of his 55-page witness statement are bold and unwavering. Blood stains the typing fingers of the tabloid press, according to Prince Harry. Mirror Group newspapers insist there's no evidence he was hacked. He'll be back at court to face more questions tomorrow. Rebecca Barry, News at 10. In his written statement, Prince Harry described the British press as being at rock bottom and said he wants to prevent anyone else going through what he has been through. A goal which begs the question, after years of phone hacking allegations and the Leveson inquiry, what has changed, if anything? And, indeed, what difference will this case make? It has shamed press barons. This is the most humble day of my life. Embarrassed politicians. There was no deal on issues to do with the media, uh, with Rupert Murdoch or indeed with anybody else. Even landed some in prison. So what new threat can today's allegations pose to those who've been to court before? Like former editor of The People, Neil Wallace, who's accused once again. One of the problems with Harry dragging his back into court again is that uh, issues that were frankly dealt with um, getting on 10, 15 years ago now, are being raked over. This hasn't happened for 20 years. Allegations of phone hacking started with the Royals in 2005, a story about Prince William's knee injury. The following years saw a flurry of celebrity settlements, but it was claims that murdered teenager Millie Dowler's phone was hacked that sparked public outrage in 2011. The News of the World closed that same month after a police investigation into its journalists that led to two convictions. Shortly afterwards, the Leveson inquiry into journalistic ethics opened in London, which recommended press reforms. But in 2018, the government scrapped the second part of the inquiry and little reform has happened, bringing us to Prince Harry's fresh allegations, which don't just include the Mirror Group newspapers, but separate cases about associated news newspapers, which owns the Mail and Mail Online, and newsgroup newspapers of Rupert Murdoch's empire. Many of the arguments in this case have been rehearsed before. What will this actually change? What would be helpful for our democracy would be if we had newspapers subscribing to an independent regulator. But that was the recommendation last time. It didn't happen. Why would it happen this time? Well, it won't happen unless the government get behind it and insist that this becomes legislation. The government won't do that because they prefer to, to get into bed with the press. Prince Harry may be driven to change the media, but will he be the one to finally motivate others? Paul Brand, News at 10 at the High Court. And I'm joined now by both Rebecca and Chris to, to discuss all of this. To you first, Rebecca, what do you think are going to be the consequences for all of this for Mirror Group if they, if they, if they lose this case? Well, it's, it's a civil trial, not a criminal one. So the judge has to weigh up on the balance of probabilities whether to believe Prince Harry. If he wins, he could be awarded damages and get a public apology. But the process of airing all this in public is part of his goal. He's never mm. wanted to settle in secret behind closed doors. In the past, Mirror Group newspapers have admitted and apologised for phone hacking. In recent years, they've paid out more than £100 million mm. settling claims. And if they lose this trial, it could open up 
up the floodgates for many more. And that could be potentially disastrous financially, let alone for their reputation. Then, of course, there's uh, Piers Morgan, one of the UK's best known journalists. It could be potentially damaging for him, especially if he's shown to have lied under oath the Leveson inquiry. I think if you were to ask Prince Harry, he'd say it's far bigger than any of that. In his lengthy witness statement, he says that this is about holding to account those powerful media companies who are masquerading as journalists. He believes that he's acting in the public interest mm -hmm. for the sake of democracy. OK, Rebecca, well, that's the public drama of the case. Chris, to you, yes. what do you think, uh, behind closed doors, the royal family will make of all of this? Well, look, today was all about Harry's relationship with the press and, you know, how the Mirror did or didn't get certain stories. And what we didn't get today was Harry dragging his family into it. And, Raggy, you'll know from covering uh, the Netflix uh, documentary and the book Spare, he often accused his father and his brother of not fighting the press, not taking them on because they wanted uh, favourable coverage. Uh, so, you know, to, to that end, I think they might... Uh, breathe a sigh of relief uh, tonight. However, there's always tomorrow. And, of course, tomorrow he's got another half day with this uh, Mirror Group uh, newspaper lawyer. Mm. And then, if he so chooses, his own lawyer, David Sher Sherborne, can ask him some questions as well. Clearly, that'll be much less uh, combative. I just think, at the end of the day, you, you can't not feel... Uh, so a lot of empathy for Harry. He mm. painted a picture of, a, of an adolescence, at least, yeah. that was very unhappy, full mm. of paranoia. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of people will feel for that. But as Rebecca was just saying, the job for the judge here is not to decide on whether Harry was happy or actually whether these stories were true or not. It's how they got the stories and whether it was done lawfully. OK, we'll be visiting this for the next few days. Thank you both, Rebecca and Chris. To Ukraine now, where for well over a year people have endured bombs and bullets, their lives being torn apart. But today, a new terror swept across Ukraine's already ravaged lands when millions of litres of water burst free after a huge dam was blown up. It happened in southern Ukraine, upstream from Kherson on the Dnipro River, a dividing line between the warring armies. Kyiv and Moscow blame each other for the destruction of the Kharkova Dam, which could hurt both sides and has forced thousands to flee their homes. Tonight, Rishi Sunak said that if it was the Russians, it represents a new low. Amid the many waves of destruction unleashed by the war, this is a catastrophe on an unprecedented scale. An unstoppable tide, and in its path, scores of towns, villages, and battlefields. Mines, it seems, detonated by the flood water. Here, the mighty Dnipro River is a front line, and both sides blame each other for this devastation. Entire homes swept away, tens of thousands of people in danger. President Zelensky accused Russia of detonating a bomb of mass environmental destruction to halt his army's advance. On the flooded streets of Kherson, liberated by Ukraine last year, rescuers worked to the sound of artillery fire. Many homes have been evacuated, many vulnerable people taken to safety. Already exhausted by months of conflict, forced again to find fresh shelter. But the greater threat is posed to the Russian control side of the river. A state of emergency was declared in Novakhovka. The city was swiftly submerged. This Russian-appointed governor claimed a Ukrainian missile strike had destroyed the dam, which also threatens drinking water supplies in Crimea, Russia's most prized conquest, where the Kremlin mobilized these emergency workers. Upstream, water emptied from the reservoir the wrecked dam was built to create. The same river cools reactors at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. There is said to be no immediate danger there. But there will be other far-reaching consequences long after the war has ended. John Ray, News at 10. 
back home and there is a sense of disbelief among the bereaved families of COVID victims that as the inquiry into the pandemic gets underway, the main focus is the legal row over Boris Johnson's WhatsApp messages and notebooks. The Cabinet Office was today given until the end of the week to decide whether to back down and hand over unredacted copies. It's also emerged that it isn't just the Cabinet Office being less cooperative than the inquiry would like. What do you think the inquiry will make of your WhatsApps, Mr Johnson? Boris Johnson was saying little this morning, but he's keen to reveal more to the Covid inquiry, more than the government wants him to. Today, in the battle over whether the inquiry should see his unredacted WhatsApp messages and diaries from the pandemic, the inquiry chair made it clear she's not backing down, despite the government opposing her requests in court. In my view, it is for the inquiry chair to decide what is relevant or potentially relevant. The Cabinet Office disagrees, claiming they are not obliged to disclose what they consider to be unambiguously irrelevant material. The lawyer for the inquiry also revealed today that key material it's requested from other departments is either late or has been sent heavily redacted. The Foreign Commonwealth Development Office has supplied to the inquiry potentially relevant WhatsApps from two of their special advisers, many with extensive redactions made to that material on the basis of relevance. May we make clear that we expect them to provide unredacted WhatsApp material without delay. To families who lost loved ones during the pandemic, it seems the government is blocking its own inquiry. It's really disappointing and upsetting and I'm, I'm glad that Baroness Hallett has, you know, sticking to her, her, her guns, but, you know, they've called the inquiry. Why would they, what have they got to hide? It looks like they're hiding something. Legal experts also believe it's Lady Hallett who has the stronger case. Very likely to win it because ultimately it has to decide, the inquiry has to decide uh, what it regards as relevant. The key issue at stake is whether the government can control the information available to the inquiry. The inquiry has asked for witness statements from key decision makers from the Johnson government, including Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss and the former Health Secretary Matt Hancock. Tonight, Rishi Sunak left Downing Street for Washington. The ongoing battle with the COVID inquiry will be a headache for him next week, with the court decision on the evidence expected swiftly and the inquiry proper opening on Tuesday. Romilly Weeks, News at 10. A criminal investigation has been launched into the death of an 81-year-old woman who was hit and killed by a police motorbike. Helen Holland was struck in West London last month by a metropolitan police motorcyclist who was part of an escort for the Duchess of Edinburgh. The police watchdog said the officer being investigated for offences including causing death by dangerous driving. Backed by Saudi Arabia, the Live Golf Tour has spent a year and vast sums of money trying to disrupt this global sport, driving its stars and fans apart. But today came a shock resolution, a merger between Live Golf and the established tours. It's a deal which hopes to unite golf. For critics who said Live Golf was simply sports washing Saudi Arabia's human rights record, it will be hard to swallow. For its bankrollers, it represents another significant sporting success. When the Saudi-backed Rebel Live Tour was launched, it tore golf apart, causing bitterness between players, effectively sparking a golfing civil war. Many top names agreed deals worth many millions of dollars. Phil Mickelson, me and Phil Mickelson. It did not go down well with those who refused to be tempted. Any decision that you make in your life that's purely for money usually doesn't end up going the right way. What they've done is they've, they've turned our, their back on what has allowed them to get to this position. Under a cloud of controversy, Live Golf was launched last year as a challenge to America's PGA Tour. It was bankrolled by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, which also owns Newcastle United. Unthinkable only a few months ago, Live is now merging with the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour, formerly known as the European Tour. There is no question, no question, this united front has the potential to positively shape the future of golf. And of course, it also marks the end of the division in our game. 
and the start of a new chapter in its evolution. Certainly not the message the established golf world was preaching about Liv until only recently. Money, it seems, as opposed to the rival tour's new formats, has changed everything. We've watched this slowly unfolding um, story of Saudi just uh, going to one sport after another, using their deep pockets to buy their way into those sports. And they're doing that from our perspective in order to continue to improve their international reputation. There are some very uncomfortable days and weeks ahead for those who remain loyal and are now being told to welcome those who weren't back into the family, very much richer than when they left. Steve Scott, News at 10. Evidence from one of ITV's bosses in Parliament today wasn't meant to be about Phil Schofield's scandal. In theory, that, that's reserved for Chief Executive Dame Carolyn McCall's appearance next week. Well, unsurprisingly, though, it came up anyway. Magnus Brook was asked about comments from this morning editor Martin Frizzell, who, in response to allegations of a toxic environment on the programme, said he thought aubergines were toxic. This was Mr Brooks's response. It was extremely ill-judged uh, to say what he did. Uh, but look, I can reassure you on behalf of ITV that we do take uh, all of these allegations very seriously precisely because we do have a culture uh, uh, in which people's conduct it matters enormously to us. Is ITV. his position secure after that? Uh, that's not a question for, for me and it's not a question for now. Responding to claims that the show is a very unhappy place, Mr Brooks said ITV has a very sophisticated and significant system of safeguarding and duty of care in place. The Confederation of British Industry has won the overwhelming backing of its members for plans to reform. After allegations of misconduct relating to its then-director-general, more than a dozen women came forward with claims that they were sexually harassed whilst working for the CBI. All too often, we report on shocking mass shootings in the United States. There have been nearly 300 this year alone. But so regular is gun violence, it often doesn't seem to make the headlines. More than 18,000 people have been killed in incidents involving firearms just this year. The statistics suggest there will have been at least one gun-related death in the time that we've been on air this evening. It may not have set a record yet, but it's only June and already 2023 is fast catching up with previous years. And in few places is gun violence more out of control than St Louis, where no one, not even the city's children, are immune. The streets of St Louis are among the most dangerous in America. This city has a murder rate 20 times the national average, and most involve firearms. Open carry laws mean guns are frequently brandished as a symbol of power and used with casual indifference. We've come to one of the toughest neighbourhoods just north of the city centre, where once grand homes have been abandoned amid rising gang violence. James lives opposite a church which symbolises the endemic urban decay here. I was walking to the gas station last night to get some gas, walking up the street, somebody just started shooting. How do a 15-year-old get a hold of military weapons? But teenagers often do, and here are the results. Another victim of a random shooting treated at a specialist clinic. This is what it looks like when a really heavy caliber bullet is going through tissue. It doesn't just have a path, it explodes. Kyrus Fisher was caught in a drive-by shooting. He was hit three times by an AK-47. Guy just came shooting up the block, like 50 rounds. Four people got shot. So it wasn't targeted at you? No, it was just wrong place, wrong time. We know that in this last year, one of our busiest trauma centers saw over 1,200 people had been shot. So you do the math, you know, this three people a day. We have an endemic level of bullets. Beyond the so-called Del Mar Divide is where much of the violence erupts. Del Mar Boulevard is a frontier between gangs and often a front line. This is a fault line between the territories of 
two rival gangs. The police here are clearly struggling to cope with an epidemic of gun violence. They didn't want to be interviewed, but one beat officer told me off the record she sees guns almost every single day. And some of her colleagues who've served in Afghanistan think these streets are more dangerous. For some families, the toll extracted by these neighbourhoods has been unimaginably high. The Usanga family fled St. Louis when their seven-year-old Xavier was caught in the crossfire. I think it tore um, a major part of our lives apart. Um, he was pretty much um, done down point blank. Um, he was shot in the throat. And so the girls, you know, tried to um, revalidate him. I turned around and... Um, I started screaming. Six, seven year old. Funeral director William Harris Jr. has buried too many children like Xavier. It's out of control. And we're, the, the number of children that we're burying is just is astronomical. We've got to do some kind of community service where we're getting to these young folk and, you know, giving them a different outlook on things as opposed to picking up a gun. The music scene in St. Louis reflects the violence on the streets. The 18-year-old rapper seen here went to prison a few months ago for shooting a man dead. New figures show there have been 70 murders so far this year. That's almost one every other day. A cycle of violence which cements St. Louis's reputation as one of America's most violent cities. Dan Rivers, News at 10, St. Louis. Back here, London Irish have become the third casualty of the financial crisis gripping rugby's premiership. The club has been suspended after neither the current owner nor an American consortium hoping to buy it could prove they had the money to compete in the league next season. London Irish also missed a deadline to pay staff and players. And finally, there's not much 3D printers can't produce clothes, homes, even now prosthetic limbs. Now the technology has been used to buy, uh, by, a British, by a British man to conquer one of climbing's toughest challenges. The Burden of Dreams boulder stands a mere four metres tall, but a quick scan of its face reveals how imposing every inch is. Previously, only one person had scaled it, but will Bozzi's printouts provide the perfect guide? In Will Bosey's sport, millimetre movements on the edges of his fingertips mean the difference between success and failure. No! Oh. Earlier this year, he set out to reach the top of the hardest boulder in the world to climb. Only one man has achieved it before, and he named the rock the Burden of Dreams. It seemed like this completely ridiculous and mythical feat. You know, out in Finland in the woods, this a, like elusive nine a boulder that's just so much harder than anything I'd done or anything I even thought I could potentially do at that time. The boulder is four meters high and involves five climbing moves, but set at a 45 degree angle, so climbers practically hang from its almost sheer rock face. Finnish boulderer Nale Hakataival became the first to complete it in 2016 after four years and thousands of attempts. So here, Will sped up the process by training using moulds that are exact replicas of the boulder, created from scans and 3D prints of its features. What's amazing with the 3D printing is you get all the detail and all the texture. Basically meant I could have a lot more time actually on the boulder without being there. Is it cheating slightly? <laughs> it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting sort of question to look at. Replica training is something that's been done in climbing for 40 years, but making them exact to the 3D printing it definitely has had a lot of discussion. The climbing community seems agreed that unless Will scaled the real boulder on his first attempt, he hadn't done anything wrong, which he didn't. But after a fortnight in Finland, the summit seemed reachable. Wow. <laughs> I felt incredible and I so almost dropped that last move again. Will's not sure if 3D printing is going to change climbing, 
but this time technology has helped bring reality and his dreams within touching distance. Ellie Pitt, News at 10, Sheffield. And that's it from the team and from me, good night. <laughs>